Welcome to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Education. I'm Pete Wright, and today we're talking about culture. And I'm Howard Tybal, and I'm talking about how to build a culture from the bottom up, or dare I say, give up control. If you're listening to this in uh, Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice, uh, please note there is a video version of this podcast with graphics and and, uh, visuals to go along with our conversation. So we invite you to jump over to your show notes and and tap the YouTube link. It'll take you over to Tybel's YouTube page, and you can watch this podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm very excited about the conversation today, Howard. You're going to walk us through a process that has has changed the tone and tenor of many institutions around their culture. How would you like to preface this? Because you sent me a, a PowerPoint deck, uh, and uh, frankly, the title seems much drier than the topic. Who the heck cares about an operational review? What this conversation is about is how do we get a community engaged and involved in making changes that they either have been complaining about for years, or from the top, they're saying, we have to think differently and do things differently. So that's what this topic is about. Let's talk about how you got into this. Talk a little bit about the work of Tybal education around institutional culture. Well, uh, you know, years ago, probably right after the economic crisis, we called this the operational review. And it has evolved probably over the last seven years to really be about culture and innovation. And every one of these kind of projects we've done, it started many years ago with Brown University. Overnight after the economic crisis, they lost over $30 million that was being contributed to the operating budget, and they acted swiftly. Most institutions kept their head in the sand. Brown said, let's not waste a crisis. And they put together work teams. And I was on the team that was helping this nine-month initiative to look under every stone to say, how can we be more efficient and effective relative to our strategy, ultimately? And then over the years, we've done these kinds of projects at many different institutions, and, and I think have learned a lot about how to engage a community to build buy-in. Let's talk then about your observations there. Obviously, this is a very human project, right? This is not something that you can only observe in a flow chart. How do people generally react to change when they're confronted with this sort of a cultural transformation? I would say culture are institutions' greatest strengths, and it's also their greatest weakness. It's the greatest strength because we have these historical practices going back, you know, to probably a thousand AD in terms of what happened in Fez, Morocco, and that evolved to what happened in Europe and then what happened in America in the, in the 1600s. And ultimately, we have these really strong educational cultures that for many of the institutions in this country model Harvard University and sort of the, the ivory tower. But ultimately, those cultural precepts and norms and rules and behaviors are the things that keep them stuck. So when they want to put a new application in like Workday, or we're going to do more online learning, or we're going to think differently about place, and we're going to create uh, satellite campuses, when you start to put in things that are not part of the traditional normative way that we work, people react with, this is threatening. There's a great quote in this workshop that I led where someone said to me, how do we create change as a sign of progress and not an attack on tradition? And that's what fundamentally happens, Pete, is that people see a change and they see it either as an attack on their traditional values or they see it as a threat to them personally. And that's a scary, scary thing, because now you're talking not just about operations and process and financials, you're talking about ideology. How do you get people to begin to see the other side of ideology? You start by recognizing that we have to, we do have to take care of people. I know leaders that have this attitude still, get with the program. Yeah. And I think that is so short-sighted that, that there's a lack of empathy from the top about how important it is to not just get your people to go along 
because it's right for the institution, but it's right to build a culture where you really do care about your employees. And I think what's happening more and more is institution leaders are taking this message out to the community. What do you need for this process to be successful. Many of them do it because they have to. They realize if they don't do it, they're going to have another failure on their hands where people are going to be unhappy with what's being imposed on them. So this particular methodology we use is about getting the right kind of data in front of them, putting people together that typically don't work together from different divisions, and solving problems around a set of administrative and academic processes, structures, systems, and basically put the work in their hands. You know, if you think about the common challenges we face in education, the changing business model, the challenge with the rating systems and Moody's downgrading the institutions, whether we can keep enrolling students in our region or are they migrating to different parts of the country, financial needs from families, the list goes on. And we never know when we're going to get a small or a large avalanche. And some of these things we have no control over. So what I'm going to keep proposing to, to institutions is we have to wake up and really take this seriously and not wait for Mount St. Helens. We can navigate small avalanches, but we have to get ahead of it. All of the challenges that you mentioned in your list of challenges that we face, they're not the easy ones, right? They're not the ones where teams can sit down who disagree with one another and see that when this problem is solved, it will look like something clear. It will look like a resolution has happened. So we can all navigate to this place that looks like resolution. In fact, it never really looks like it's resolved. It only really looks like the next step in another problem to tackle. And you've used this avalanche analogy before, right? We've shared a laugh around the, the whole, you know, triggering the avalanche. Mm-hmm. Provoking the avalanche. Provoking the avalanche. Yes, thank you. Uh, so provoking the avalanche, inviting the sort of change and making it happen, right? I mean, how do you get to the other side of that? Well, it's interesting. Inviting. I think we have to stop thinking we have control over what's coming. Yeah. Every single day, we are attempting to exert control over an uncertain future. And I think a better analogy for us is to think about ourselves as navigators. We're pointing our ourselves towards a future. And the question is, who are we in this conversation? Are we sitting here trying to retain a certain amount of control to be able to predict a future? Or do we recognize more and more things are uncertain? There is more external factors, evolving technology, and also internal pressures that what we have to do is empower ourselves and empower our teams to be ready for these changes. It changes the nature of our objectives, right? It changes the nature of what we're trying to do. Changing that perspective from always inviting the avalanche to, I'm going to stay ahead of this wave. I just want to be ready for whatever comes next. It changes the way we look at the table set for the things we have to accomplish in the institution. Yeah. Another way I'd say it is it changes what our perspective is and what we think our role is. Prepare ourselves and recognize we're going to have more and more changes coming our way that we can't predict. And it's always been the case. The difference now is it is accelerating around us so much more that I think people have a choice. They're either going to try and exert more control over the domains that they're responsible for, or they're going to say, I need to give up this control and have it be more of a collective kind of engagement. And by the way, that is exactly why I found this kind of process to be so powerful. There are three things that people get out of this I I have discovered. One, build an engaged community. As much as leaders like to think that their people are engaged, everyone's got their head down from the top down, from the cabinet, from the present level. Everyone's focused on their individual area. And what does it mean to work together through a problem? Not just the people you see every day or the cube next to you, but how do you to put facilities together with HR folks, with IT folks, with faculty, and even students to say, here's a shared problem, let's work through it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there's no single person who understands how a university or college works. So part of this raises the collective awareness of how the enterprise functions. And what happens with this 
is it creates an empathy. When you begin to see all the things that are going outside of your particular department or division, you have a much deeper appreciation of how it works to actually deliver on the promise of what we're giving students and also the research we're doing. And the third and probably most important one, it sends a message to the community. We care more about what you think, and this is leaders saying this, than what we think is important. The work is happening at the ground level. So it's a bottom-up approach for the larger community to participate in the future direction of who they want to be. And that is something that can come out of an exercise like this. So let's talk about what the practical application of this process looks like. Can you talk a little bit about the structure and decision making? Yeah. Imagine that you're looking to get an understanding about where are their areas for improvement in the academic and administrative enterprise. It starts with a set of work teams that are looking at a particular set of areas. So for example, a work team might be looking at marketing. Another team might be looking at athletics or facilities or external relations or our utility functions or the student experience, the list goes on. You come up with a set of work teams that you're ready to empower to do some work around How can we improve on those particular areas? These people come together, and within these work teams, you populate them with individuals from different functional areas. So for example, if there was a work team focused on the, let's pick one, marketing functions, integrated marketing, how do we do a better job of having integrated marketing functions across our whole system? You have on this particular work team people that live in marketing, but more importantly, people who are users of marketing. So could be people who are passionate about it but work in facilities, some IT folks, some faculty that have a perspective on it, maybe even students. So imagine anywhere between seven and ten people looking at marketing as a discipline that the university is trying to do a better job of to make it more integrated – And they have a period of time to investigate how can we improve on that. These cross-functional teams would generate a set of ideas that would then get presented to what I'll loosely call a steering committee. And again, this steering committee is not necessarily the cabinet. We've done this where it has been the cabinet. We've also done it with the steering committee are just a representative sample of individuals that care deeply about the university, that work across the whole institution. And ultimately, the work is to generate ideas that the steering committee can then listen to and you present to, and then the decision-making then goes to the president or the president and cabinet to say, here's what we've learned, here's what we'd like to move forward. Now, how is this different from putting together just you know a committee to do something yeah right <laughs> i can tell you exactly usually it's the it's the difference between direct and indirect participants right it, what i'm usually expecting when i walk into a marketing committee meeting right is i'll have marketing folks representative usually that's creative advertising folks that are you know you, most of our privates are on a shoestring so it'll be one or two people and then enrollment and res life generally that right, have the, right. the direct sort of marketing requirements, right, or expectations. And that's it. Coming up with the ideas for promotion. So what I'm hearing you say is we're dramatically broadening the scope of interest in marketing to well beyond those who might have a bit of a shallower uh, or a narrower view. Yeah, that's a great point, because the broader perspective is really honoring that we have people who have a perspective about how marketing is working here, but they're rarely asked to weigh in on this. When we don't do this, what we do is we think it's all about putting experts in a position to make decisions. This is a way of saying, you're gonna get to know other people who you've never seen before. I recently did a project at a university, and one of the work groups reflected in the kickoff event, some of them were saying, we've talked to the people that are part of my work group. I've worked here for five years. I've never met them before, Mm -hmm. face-to-face. And now I'm in a work group charged with looking at how we're going to improve. In this case, it was a comp and benefits team. This process is about giving up control 
at the cabinet level and saying, we're going to put together 100 to 120 people if they had 10 work groups, and you're going to have a period of time to do idea generation around ways that we can improve operations. And on the academic side, the administrative functions that happen, because this lives in the world of the academy. It also lives in the world of administrators. It's loosely understood by business people as operational efficiencies, but that's much too narrow to call it that. This is really, as you said at the beginning, this is about culture. This is about doing things differently and, and asking the question, which is the number one thing we don't ask enough of, is why are we doing it this way? Mm-hmm. Why do we have a admission process that works this way or a transfer process? Or advising process. We're in the middle advising. of this right now. We have an oh advising God. process where the advisors are are no longer being sufficiently trained in the programs that they're advising, and so they're putting students where they shouldn't belong. It's a tragedy that comes out of marketing and enrollment, but if advising and operations yeah. aren't involved, they'll never know. So speaking as a faculty member, I know a lot of faculty who would be very interested in being involved in not just marketing, but facilities and yes. information technology and the library, and they're never asked. And they have a point of view on this. So here is a perfect time for us to show people the kinds of work groups that could get put together. And this is just a sampling of four different institutions that represent the ways they organized their particular project. So institution one, they had 10 work groups Each work group made up of academic folks, administrative folks, and staff, and in some cases where it was appropriate students. And you can see institution two, three, and four, they also have some overlap, but you'll see in one case, one institution had an athletics team, others didn't. And it really came down to, and this is where the senior team has to really start this process to say, where do we want to look? How broadly or how narrow do we want to look? We had one institution that just did three work groups. Because they said, you know what, these are the things we want to tackle. So this is an example of broadening the way we're going to look at our work and then inviting across the community individuals to participate. By the way, the individuals were nominated. So this is another exercise that you do is who are the people in our community who have things to contribute who have never been part of something like this. I can tell you the coolest thing about this, Pete. I have yet to do one of these where an institution has said to me, or people that have worked there have said to me, and if they've worked there a long time, they'll say this, we have never done something like this. There's a lot of operational efficiency projects out there, but they're not done like this. We're going to give you a structure, and then we're going to set you loose. Mm -hmm. Now, ultimately, the way this works from a timing standpoint is there's some pre-work and then you know a project kickoff. The 100 people who are on this project have been personally invited by the president to participate in something that is about helping change the culture. This is an invitation, but ultimately, when you get a request from the president to say, we'd like you to be part of an inclusive idea generation, blue sky kind of uh, project to look at how we can improve how we are as an institution, people step up. Okay. You know, our role, meaning Tybal Education's role, is as a guide. So we've got all the templates and we've got the process. We help co-facilitate the kickoff. And there is a mechanism for how they get through this over this period. And, And all we're looking at here is some pre-work that has to happen to populate, you know, what are the work groups and who's going to be on them, who's going to lead the project, and so on. A kickoff and then a idea generation phase, a phase of where the ideas get presented to the steering committee. The last project we did, there were over 375 ideas that came from eight work groups. Wow. And not only that, they sent out a call to anybody in the community that wanted to submit an idea over the internet. And they got another probably 200 to 300 ideas over the internet. Some really great and some completely wacky. Right. But it w- it's all about demonstrating inclusivity, right? And then the last part of this project 
is for the leadership to then look at what has been then shared by the steering committee. This is what we heard, and they score the ideas based on different criteria. And then the leadership gets to step back and go, all right, we have now had this wealth of ideas we never could have come up with on our own. And now what do we want to do with them? Ideas that we're going to move forward with, things that are not consistent with mission, but ultimately on the other side of this, you have a wealth of individuals who now have had a chance to contribute to this work. Now, obviously, as you're, if you're listening to this, you're saying, well, what about managing expectations? And are we setting up people up? You know, do they know enough to do this? And I can tell you that we don't give enough credit to folks to be able to trust their judgment understanding of what's going on in the institution. And we don't need as much data as we think to make decisions. Now, the project we're on right now, there's a resource team, and there's a resource team that is made up of individuals from HR, finance, institutional research, and they're fundamentally there as guides. There's so much data outside. There's data about where institutions are going that are in your sector that you can get as publicly recognized data, but most likely your HR area, your finance area, and also institutional research can provide these work groups with some basic information to start their dialogue. One of the grand achievements of going through this process is it changes the way people think and approach their work, right? It, it's a professional development exercise. That's a great point. People go into this thinking that they're, all right, they're in another committee, when in fact what they learn is this is not structured in that way. But when we've done the wrap-up sort of celebration event of all the good work and thanking people, and you ask people, what did you get out of it? They say things like, I never understood what the whole operation looked like. I have a much deeper appreciation for how we work here as an institution. And also you gave us some tools, you meaning the project, gave us some tools for how to take back into my day-to-day -day job. So one of those tools, for example, is the decision-making model that you and I have talked about. You know, think about Pete. All of a sudden, find yourself at a kickoff, sitting around a table with 10 folks, and there's 10 other tables, and you've never met half these people. And now you're going to schedule a weekly meeting or, or bi-weekly meeting with this group to look at facilities utilization or marketing, and you're going to spend three to four months with this group in this kind of process. You are building a team. So the tools like the decision-making model is great because what they learn out of the gate is, you know what, before we get into brainstorming what are some of our ideas, what does success look like, right? If we were successful looking at, pick a topic, marketing or administrative structure or how our utilities work or student engagement, if we were successful, what does that look like? And we've discovered when we teach them how to use these tools, this particular one, they have this in front of them and they get to experiment in this project in a way where when they take it back to their work, it's so much easier to integrate it back. It's almost like they get to experiment in a safe environment with new ways of doing things that is different from how they typically work back at their offices. You know, we've talked about the de decision-making model uh, in the past. I think we've done a whole episode on, on the podcast on the decision-making yeah. model. But but the, the real gift of the decision-making model for, for me is the way it bunches your cognitive approach to problem-solving. Excellent. Ultimately, it's helping people practice the art of different kinds of conversations that we're in. There's one conversation that we're in at times, sometimes unconsciously, is why are we talking about this? Another conversation is how do we want to do it? And the third conversation is what do we want to do? Most of us are skilled at talking about what we want to do. We have some fewer people who are good at the how because that requires brainstorming. And very few of us are practicing why, even senior leaders, they don't know to ask why enough. So this is a mechanism for practicing those three kinds of conversations in a safe environment with a team that you have a particular charge with to move forward. So that's the first kind of tool. The other tool that we're just integrating into the most recent project is 
we have done this Creativity Inc. Read the book about Pixar and the mechanisms that Pixar uses to create a high-performing organization. We have done that as a standalone, just pure idea generation. We are just about to launch a modified version of this Creativity Inc. workshop for an institution to empower their 10 working teams to learn these mechanisms and then bring them back to this particular project. So so this is another really exciting innovation for us is to merge something that is really great in its own, stands on its own, the idea of learning mechanisms around how to be effective to, to create a high quality product or service, but merge that with this administrative academic operational review to empower these new teams to hit the ground running. I, I, I love it. And, and what I love the most about it is this is so clearly inspired you, the way you think about your work and your approach to this work. You can you can really tell the way your work is changing as a result of integrating all these new concepts. I, you know, I love that you point that you know, my passion out to the, for this, because I think what's interesting that's happening is there's a certain kind of coming together of things I've been doing for many years, and now the why is becoming clearer to me, that the real breakdown is not that we don't have great ideas, but we don't set ourselves up to be able to engage each other so that we can realize these. These happen out of conversation. The nature of what we're going to create looking to the future is not going to come about because we're going to sit alone at our desk and write memos or emails to each other. It's going to come out of doing a better job of building trust and creating a community to explore how we want to grow and not waiting for the senior leaders to figure it out, and not for senior leaders to be sitting around being frustrated that things are not going well. This has to be a shared effort. Well, I am certainly grateful for this conversation, Howard. If anything, just learning that this kind of work is going on gives me great hope. How would you like people to learn more? I would say to anybody who is looking at this and is inspired by the idea of a bottom-up decision-making that is to call me. Yeah, uh, you know, go on our website, go to the contact page and reach out to me. I'd be happy to share with you some of these ideas, inquire with you some questions, make some suggestions. The value we bring in this is really as partners and guides, not as uh, sort of the different kind of consulting model, which is uh, we have the answers. No, we don't have the answers. You have the answers, but we can guide you to be able to have a effective experience as a community. So, so, uh, so reach out to me. It's that simple. Easy enough. Uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this episode. We certainly appreciate your time and attention. On behalf of Howard Teibel, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on Navigating Change, the podcast from Teibel Education. Mm-hmm.